Our next speaker for today, Drury Crawley, PhD. Drury is a Bentley Fellow slash Director of Building Performance and Research at Bentley Systems. And I will now hand over the virtual mic to him to give our sustainable infrastructure keynote. Drew? Uh, good morning. Let's see, I guess I gotta put my video on in just a second. Okay. Uh, good morning, welcome, and thank you for the kind invitation of uh, uh, to to talk about uh, work that I've been doing, and more specifically, Ashray has been doing with uh, with power over the the last several decades, actually. Um, so, I today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what Ashray is and what we do, and how we use that, and how that's been affected by uh, power and, and our long-term relationship there. So next slide, please. So ASHRAE has been publishing climate data uh, for almost 60 years in their handbooks. We have a handbook, it's a quadrennially uh, published document that has sort of the basics, the fundamentals about uh, dealing with HVAC equipment, heating, ventilating, air conditioning equipment. Uh, we do this, uh, these data are collected primarily from uh, uh, ground stations, but we also have been uh, using other data recently for, for doing that. We also have a standard which is used by uh, a number of other uh, energy codes and standards throughout the world as kind of the basis for having data related to building design. Uh, part of this, we also produce trends to show how the climatic data is already changing. And we are already seeing some of that signal in there. Uh, some places not very strong, but other places quite quite a bit. We've been working with uh, NOAA and their National Centers for uh, Environmental Information for more than 40 years. They've been uh, part of the ASHRAE team and contributing directly to that uh, for our standards and our handbooks during that period. <clears throat> Over 15 years ago, um, NASA Power started uh, collaborating directly with the ASHRAE community, beginning to look at how that data could be used to supplement what we were getting from the, the ground stations. Next slide, please. Uh, the data we do is a summary material. We create tables, uh, look at wind roses, trends, even histograms of, of the data. Next slide. Uh, but we're limited by our data source. This are, these are the 20,000-ish, uh, I'm sorry, it's 13,000 um, locations that are uh, within the, the handbook and the standard today. And you can see North America and Europe are quite well represented, but we have some big holes in lots of other places. And that's one of the areas that power can, can supplement. Uh, for example, Nigeria there in uh, uh, central um, Central West Africa um, had it, the largest economy in Africa, and we had no data for that particular location. So this is one of the roles that, that power can uh, can do. Uh, next slide. Um, we also produce climate maps. Uh, they're static, though. This is the one from the latest standard. Um, the um, next next slide clip. Uh, we produce these at uh, about a half a degree uh, grid globally to be able to show how what the various climate zones. These affect the energy standards and what uh, requirements they'll put at various elements. Uh, next slide, please. But we have from power, we can uh, be able to look at different aspects of that. The climate zones are not static. If you can click, please. Uh, you would see them moving. You can see them moving. So the earlier period to this period, we're seeing somewhat of changes, particularly in the white band in the center, which is the, the hottest uh, band around the country. But even more powerful uh, to be able to show this, uh, next slide, is that we can look at a rolling climate zone map and begin to determine whether it makes sense to have uh, the static 
maps in a particular place or to allow them to um, uh, just stay where they are. And so this is so somewhat showing that uh, the, the hottest climate zone as we get toward later in the, the 20, uh, the 2000s, you'll see that, that that's moving up. If you look closely from Cuba to uh, South Florida, you'll begin to see that climate zone moving up into that. And that's the, the warming trend that we are already seeing. Next slide, please. So uh, I want to talk about a study that um, uh, we started. Um, this is separate from ASHRAE, but this is uh, some work that I've been doing to try to look at comparing various data sources. Um, we're comparing directly the, the hourly data, but also looking at the, the long term. Um, Hourly data is used regularly in, in building energy simulation, and so we, we need a, a, a set of data for that, and I'll, I'll explain more about that. But for this, we're looking, we're comparing um, four different sources. Um, one is the ground-based stations integrated surface database from, from NOAA. That has been the source for the ASHRAE design conditions uh, since the 1960s. And that is uh, the, the most detailed. They have 20,000 stations, but only about 13,000 of them have enough detail that were able to be included. Uh, the BSRN or uh, uh, network is uh, 58 weather stations with very fine detail uh, data, primarily solar radiation. Uh, some of the meteorological data is, is a little um, missing. I'll say it's not always there. But it, it can be used to, to validate some of the, the solar radiation data. Of course, power, which we're here to talk about today, uh, using a grid of uh, 0.5 latitude by 5 8 degree longitude. Um, there's also the European reanalysis data set um, that has a 0.25 uh, grid for Latin long as well. Next slide, please. So we are. Uh, Looking at 32 locations, there is some overlap in terms of climate zone. If you look at the far right, the climate zone start at zero and move up to eight. That's from hottest to coldest. And we have some overlap, but the, you see the second column there says uh, coastal and water. We wanted to look at the impact because it, it's been seen that some of the, the gridded products uh, have some difficulty or or some, I won't say difficulty, some variation in, in what's going on with with the uh, uh, with large bodies of water. Next slide, please. So you see we have a number of locations uh, throughout the world that, that we're going to be looking at. Uh, five of these have the BSRN. As you saw, there were only 58 locations. So we don't have a lot of that data to, to compare, but we will be looking at, at the, the two reanalysis sets versus ground stations. Uh, next slide. So um, for a quick study that I just completed uh, last week, um, we, we looked at five locations, particularly because all five had uh, BSRN stations uh, associated with them, uh, two in Brazil, one in Australia, one in Algeria, and then Sioux City, Iowa in the US. And I see the climate zones vary a little bit. Um, we just had uh, no high quality BSRN data for the other locations. Um, we selected what we call a, a, a typical meteorological year, which is uh, assimil uh, assimilated from uh, months that are uh, determined to be typical for that particular location for the period underway. And so we, we have data working with the most recent uh, set of data, 2007 to 2021. Uh, but I'm only going to show 2016 for this. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows Washington, D.C. This is National Airport, and this is only um, through 2016. I don't have the most recent five months, uh, but what this is is a small office building that I've simulated using that uh, data from the individual years starting in 1938. And National Airport here in Washington has uh, is the only continuous uh, station I found with data this long. There are some uh, European 
stations that started in the 1930s collecting hourly data or even finer, but they had not, um, um, they they have missing gaps in the in the 40s after World War II particularly. So this is uh, kind of one of the unique ones. If you'll click once, please. So the far right bar is the typical meteorological layer, TMY. And what its goal is, is to put itself about in the center of what you would expect from the uh, from the years. And you see the individual years about plus or minus 10% for national airport for that. So that that is uh, kind of where we're trying to get, but we do have interannual variation. Uh, heating and cooling can vary quite a bit. Next slide, please. So we took a look at uh, comparing some of the, the climate variables. Here's uh, global horizontal. We have a little bit of a shift, not significant uh, for most of the, the variation there. Uh, this is for Alice Springs in uh, uh, Australia. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> here's similar for temperature. Uh, you see the the smoother lines tend to be some of the reanalysis data sets. They t uh, have a tendency to smooth out some of the variation um, uh, that you would see in the in the, in the ground data that's uh, provided here. Next slide, please. Uh, relative humidity, we see much more range in what's going on, and I'm not surprised particularly by that uh, that we're getting. Uh, variation among among the various uh, data sets. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, going on to Florianopolis in Brazil, um, some variation, but not too bad on the global horizontal. Um, some issues. It looks like kind of in the the uh, December time frame. Uh, next slide. Uh, but some issues on the direct normal, and I, I don't remember, I think this may have been the BSRN data that uh, is the blue line and, and is looking off of it. Uh, we did have some difficulty with the, the data there I'm looking at, but I haven't looked into it in detail. Uh, next slide. Uh, temperature, Florianopolis. Um, Florianopolis, uh, it's on an island that's about 40 miles long, and um, this so it, it is very much tempered by the uh, the surrounding ocean for that. But we see not too bad on temperature, but we are seeing some of the, the diurnal ranges, uh, I would say squashed a bit by uh, in the reanalysis data sets. Um, next slide. Uh, wind speed. I'm not surprised by the variation. Wind is one of the things, at least in building science, that uh, we understand that wind measured at airports is not going to be anything like an urban situation or even suburban. So this variation is, is very much in line with what I would expect to see. Next slide. Uh, we go to Algeria. Uh, Taman Rasset is up at, uh, I think, 4,000 feet of elevation, so it's it's quite high. Uh, we're getting one of the data sets that uh, is a bit low. I'm not entirely sure. I think that one is is also the um, <clears throat> the BSRN in this case. Um, I'm not too worried about that within the in in the scope of this um, because the BSRN uh, don't <clears throat> really the the focus for me on that is is the solar radiation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, wind direction, not bad, it, considering it's uh, within the, you know, 30 degrees or so. That's that's pretty good variation there. Again, <coughs> with that variation among uh, between uh, ground measurement station where your building may be, that's reasonable. Um, next slide, please. So what we did taking this data, we've looked kind of at the at the long term version of that. Um, and we simulated using a, a building energy simulation program, uh, a 50,000 square foot uh, medium office prototype building that's used um, in standards analysis for within ASHRAE, but also used by um, the Department of Energy's national labs in evaluating 
where standards are going. <clears throat> so what I did was simulate 2016 and the typical data that TMY derived from that uh, individual years for each of the four um, data sets. Next slide, please. So what we have here, um, we have the five locations, Alice Springs, Brasilia, Florianopolis, Sioux City, and Taman Rasset. Um, the Alice Springs data <coughs> presented some problems and the simulations were not successful, but then we have clusters of bars. We have the BSRN, TMY 2016, and TMY X, as well as an uh, ER, same for ERA5. I did not have a typical for power uh, when I did this, I do now, uh, as well as the ISD or the, the ground station being the last bars. And if you look at the cluster of bars on overall energy use, it's about within that noise level that you're seeing on the interannual data. So I'm not too worried about uh, that. But if we go and look at uh, the uh, next slide, please. Um, what we see, this just isolates heating, cooling, and fans, which are the, the energy that uh, is primarily driven by uh, temperature and solar differences. And what you'll see is that we're getting quite a bit more variation uh, between data sets, and particularly in a couple of cases. If you can clip once, please. Um, and so we want to go back and look. Um, in, in this case, I'm not sure why the power um, cases were so much higher than or lower for Tamman Rasset. Uh, for compared to the others, and we want to go back and and compare some of the other variables such as heating and cooling degree days, and begin to look at, at what's going on there. Uh, so this is just early results. I, I have not uh, really uh, had time to uh, dig into the reasons behind this. So next slide, please. So. Early observations from from some of this, and just from our experience using, using reanalysis, the the graded data tend to smooth out some of the normal variation you'll see uh, hour to hour from a ground station, uh, which can be quite variable and and not very smooth at all. Um, we we have seen evidence, and I'm not seeing it yet here, but um, that large bodies of water, uh, lakes, rivers, coasts. And one good example of that, I, I did a study uh, about a year ago, um, taking a look at two airports here in Washington, D.C., the National Airport, which I showed you the full period of record, and then Dulles Airport, and comparing it against uh, data from power. And when I overlaid the power hourly data on to the um, the Dulles data, it was pretty accurate. They are in, both within the same um, grid. Uh, so they they should be similar, but because of the effect of the Potomac River, uh, National Airport is, is very much more affected and, and uh, milder in many cases. So it stays uh, cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. Uh, the airport surrounded on three sides by the Potomac, so not particularly surprising. Uh, what we're seeing is temperatures and solar radiation are reasonably close. Um, at, at least from what we've seen from these five locations and just looking at a couple snapshots of data. We're seeing more variation in other variables, but that, I think that's going to be reasonable for where we're going right now. Um, okay, next slide, please. So uh, work underway. Uh, this research is going to continue uh, over the next few months. We're going to complete the analysis of the 32 locations for the four building types. We'll fill in uh, the holes where we didn't have the, the typical for power example, but <clears throat> we wanted to work with uh, four uh, buildings that, that tended to be a little more climate sensitive, uh, a school, uh, small, medium offices in, a, in a, an apartment building to, to see if we're actually having much impact on that. My, my good feeling is that the um, reanalysis data, particularly power, are going to be useful uh, regardless, but I, I want to show that through through simulation and, and results. Uh, we'll, we'll be adding more data uh, about uh, heating and cooling uh, uh, information, uh, particularly the equivalent full load hours. I'm 
concerned that that might be a, a place where they vary widely. And essentially, that's just a measure of how many hours of heating and cooling in a year. Um, it that that is something that we've used in, in doing future climate studies to look at the impact of cooling dropping by 50 percent, but heating. Uh, I mean, sorry, heating dropping by 50 percent, but cooling going up by about 30 percent. We'll also look at the more detailed comparison. I want to look at uh, typical days throughout the year uh, for both. Uh, of all the data sets and be able to, to look at um, individual variables rather than um, accumulated. Uh, next slide, please. So, and one more click. Thank you. So, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and thank you, NASA, for the opportunity to, to uh, share some of our insights today.